Redeemer liveth, that he shall stand upon the latter days of this earth. And when skin worm shall have destroyed this earthly tabernacle of mine, shall yet I shall see within my flesh of the God whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold not another. For the writer reminds us today that we brought nothing into this world. And in the end, it is certain that we can carry nothing out. But the Lord now reminds you and I that he has given he has now taken what belongs to him. But blessed be the name of the Lord. So Lord, let me know my end and the number of my days that I may be certified to how long I now have to live. Behold thou has made my days, as it were, a span long. And my eyes is never before thee. I know now my age is nothing in respect before you, for thou verily we say, every man that is living it is only together through vanity. For man walketh in his vain shadows, and he disquieteth within himself, it all in vain. He heapeth up riches, in the end, as he gathereth them, he cannot tell. And so I must ask the question, in my mind, O oh God, what is my hope? What do I have now? I know truly my hope is even in thee. O oh God, deliver me from all of my offenses and make me not a rebuke unto those things that are foolish. When thou rebukest, you chastened man for his sin. His beauty is consumed all the way. And he says it like, in a metaphor, he says, it is like a moth that's flirting the garment. Every man all together Again, he says, nothing but vanity. O oh God, hear my prayer. And O oh Lord, with thine ear, consider my cry. Hold not thy peace. Cause of shedding of my tears. I know now, this moment I know now I'm just a sojourner. I'm just a stranger. Like my fathers who have gone before me, the day reminds me and all of us, we cannot stay. We're just passing through. The day reminds all of us, you don't even own self. Everything belongs to God. The very breath we breathe is because of God. So Lord, then I know now when the writer say you are our refuge. From one generation to another, 
Before you ever scooped up the dirt and formed it to be a mountain, you brought forth forever the earth and the world, forever made from your hand. Thou art God, and you from everlasting to everlasting, to a world that has no end. Thus you turn man to destruction and again say it to him, come again, ye children of men. Listen to what he says. He said, for a thousand years, just in your sight, it was like it was just yesterday. Seeing it to be like a past, a watch that is in the night. The prophet said, your life, my life, our life is just like the vapor. It's here today and it is gone. So then you scatter them and even when they have fallen asleep. And we are faded away like the grass. The writer reminds us the metaphor we're like the grass. He says, listen, when the morning that grass is green, symbolizes fertility, life, strength. Oh, it grows up strong. But, that conjunction, but in the evening, the grass eventually has to be cut. And when it is cut down, that grass eventually dries up and it withers away. So we then are consumed away in displeasure. Our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For when thou art angry, our days are gone. As it were a tale to be told. The days of our age, he says to man, is three score years and ten. And though men may be strong, that they may come to reach a four score year, but yet in their strength and in their labor and of their sorrow, and so soon passeth away. And then, he is gone. So then, O oh Lord, then teach us. Oh, please teach us to know the numbers of our days that we may be able to apply the teachings, the principles, the precepts to our being. As we say unto him, glory be unto the Father, Glory be unto the Son. Glory be unto the Holy Ghost. As it were in the beginning, so is it now. And forevermore shall be without a world that of no end. As we stand upon these mundane shores and salute, not only a soldier, but a child of God. It was the other day that none of us could say it, but Christ himself could only be the one to say, well done. All of our desires to hear that, that word to us, well done, servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. As we stand upon these mundane shores and celebrate the life, of Mr. Warren Harden Rogers, Jr. As we cry here, we believe the other day there was no shedding of tears on the other side. 
We say goodbye here. But over there, there is no more goodbyes. We wear dark clothing here, but over there, there is no more wearing of dark clothes. We came in with the hearse, wheels turning, reefs on doors, but over there, there is no more hearse. Over there, you will not see any more caskets, any more spreads. Over there, where the writer said, where the wicked will cease from their trouble. God knows we got troubles on this side. But how many know when you get on the other side, there'll be no more troubles. There'll be no more tears. Every day will be like howdy. Grandmama said, Sabbath will have no more end. And so until that day shall come, we shall see him again on the other side. Sleep on and rest. Mr. Warren Harden Rogers, Jr., we shall meet each other again on the other shore. You may be seeing the joy of the Lord. Amen. If you love the Lord and you know you come to bless his name, even in this time of sorrow and tears, put your hands together and thank God. He's giving you another opportunity to praise his name. Blessed be unto the name of our holy God. To all of our live screen family who are watching us alive, those who are watching this service, Perhaps wherever you may be, we certainly thank you for tuning in, showing your love and your concerns for the Rogers family. Some have traveled great distance, different parts of the country to come and say their goodbye. And we certainly thank them that God granted them all traveling graces and mercies. But equally more important, we thank God for the many hosts of reverends and clergy, pastors, and elders, evangelists, and others that's with us in person and perhaps those who are watching us alive. We greet you in the marvelous and matchless name of our God, Savior of our world. What an honor it is to stand before you as we celebrate the life and the fond memories of Mr. Warren Hardin, Jr., Hardin Rogers, Jr., as we come to his lovely wife and to his children, grandchildren, great-grand nieces and nephews, brothers and sisters and siblings and others cousins and all and more importantly classmates and friends we all come to celebrate the fond memories of Mr. Rogers Jr. Amen. Blessed be on this name. Now the family has given us directions of the order of our service that they want us to follow as we operate under the auspices of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible declares we do all his work decently with respect and of order. Amen. We are so delighted to do that. At this time, we're now going to have a solo uh, by Miss Taylor. Following Miss Taylor, we will then again have the reading of the sacred passages of scriptures. Amen. We will have the reading of the Old Testament, the Old Canaan, read by the Reverend Albert Thompson, one of the sons of the Bethlehem Church. And then I will come back and I will re-uplift the reading of the New Testament, Canaan, found in the book of Thessalonica. Chapter 4, and following that, we will have one change in prayer and selection. We're going to ask uh, Reverend Bush, amen, to come and lead us in prayer of comfort. Is it John? Yeah, that's a correction. We're going to have Pastor McGriff will come and, if he will, Give us that prayer following, amen, the passage of scriptures. And then we will have that selection by uh, Pastor uh, Gibbs. Johnny Gibbs, Dr. Gibbs will come in that manner. Let's now receive Sister Taylor. She shall bless us, amen, with uplifting of our spirit of songs. Sister Taylor. Song glad morning. When this life is over, oh, I'll fly away to the home on God's celestial shores. I'll, I'll fly away in the morning. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. Oh. 
to participate in these homegoing services for my friend Tim. For I've known Tim almost seven years. We grew up together, went to school together, where many of us were wild and unruly. Tim was meek, humble, and mild. That's enough to give God a hand clap of praise right there. The Old Testament scripture, Psalms 23, where we find these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul, leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, he comfort me. Thy prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, leadeth me he anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's word for God's people in times like these. will find the sacred passage readings of Paul's letter to the church at 1 Thessalonica, the fourth chapter, and I'd like to lift to your hearing beginning at that 13th verse, and I will conclude with the 18th verse of this letter. Paul ascribed from the sacred passage of the scripture of the New Testament by saying, but I will not have you ignorant, brothering, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them 
which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I conclude with that 18th verse when Paul says, Wherefore, Roger family, comfort one another with these words. May God's word soar deep in your soul and remember to be absent from this body is the only way Mr. Rogers can be with God. At this time, we now have Pastor McGriff to come lead, will lead us in prayer. Following Reverend McGriff, we will then have, again, Reverend Dr. Johnny Gibbs to lead us in a little melody. Let's receive Pastor McGriff. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us pray together. Holy God, righteous and true in every way, the perfecter of our lives. You made us in your image, shaped us by the image of Christ, and you receive us back to yourself. We thank you today, O oh God, for this occasion to honor this man of God. We thank you for his legacy, for his life, and for his love. We thank you today, O oh God, that you will, in fact, bring comfort to this family. We have seen and even heard tears in this place today, but we know that you will one day wipe away every tear from our eyes. Oh, how we rejoice at your goodness and your grace. You have allowed Brother Tim to be among us for a few days. The days that he was with us were good days. We thank you for his life, oh God, how he impacted and impressed upon his family, upon his friends, even upon this nation. We honor him as even this American flag is draped across the casket, knowing that he served with honor his nation in a time of war. Thank you, Lord, for keeping him even during that time. We thank you, O oh God, for this marvelous spouse to whom he committed his life and the children that were born to this union. We thank you and pray for them and for the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. While he was here with us, he accomplished so much. Most of all, he loved those who loved him. And now, O oh God, as we honor his life, and as we think about his life, we are blessed to remember the next life where we will meet together and rejoice around your throne forever. Bless now, O oh God, this congregation, this your people, the sheep of your pasture. Tim has received his reward now, a crown of glory, but we are yet here. We are yet remaining in this place of trial and tribulation. Be with us now, O oh God. Encourage us, O oh God, that we may live a life clean and pure, and that we will see Tim once again. Now, O oh God, bless us, keep us, hold us, encourage us, and lead us to that place where we will sing your songs of glory forevermore. We pray this prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. And the Church of God said, Amen.
Let the church say amen. Y'all say amen again. Amen. This is supposed to be a homegoing service. And we're going to treat it as such. Uh, a few years ago, we was at Green Hill to Mama Susie's funeral. And as we was going to the gravesite, Tim told me, asked me, would I do at least three songs? I said, if I live, I live him. I said, well, that's a little long for a Baptist church. <laughs> Amen. So I'm going to sing one song and two half a song. Some of y'all might call it a medley. And you know what that is? A little bit of this and a little bit of that. Now, I am in place because the pastor know I'm going to sing. Tim knows I was going to sing because I told him about I live him, I was going to sing. And Bobby Rogers confirmed me and told me he wanted me to sing a song and pray a proud. I pray a proud. I decided I was going to move myself and let my pastor, the family pastor, do that prayer. Amen. And I can't sing the song that one of the song that Tim requests because my wife helped me sing that and she's a little ill today, so we're gonna pinch it something else. <laughs> now if we got any Jubilee singers in here, we wanna hear your voices. I didn't say sanctuary is a quiet all that stuff. You know? I don't know about y'all, but Tim was old school. Now if you're sixty-five years old. You in the old school zone. You might dress better and look better, but if you're 65, you in the old school. And if you like many people, you don't like Jubilee singing. But I'm gonna do what Tim asked me to do. I ain't got no better sense than to do what he asked me to do. Amen. And one of the short half a song going to be, There's a better day is coming by and by. Our Lord, when I reach that city, Lord, way up in the sky, all of my trouble will be over, Lord, and I'll be home at last. There's a better day coming by and by. Well, Lord, a better day is coming by. Well, Lord. think a better day coming, just keep on living. A better day is coming by and by. Tim said something about this song, Amen, and I'm going to sing a few verses of it, half of it, and that'd be two halves. And it goes like this. I want 
to be at the meeting. Well, Lord, and I want to be at the meeting. Well, Lord, and I want to be at the meeting. Well, now when all the saints come, well, 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 then after separating, Lord, from the right and the wrong, I said, and I want to be at the meeting around the throne. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to divide that half into half. Because y'all know what it said now. Now, I want you to sing a little better than that. We're going to treat Tim's song better than that. <laughs> Amen. I want to be at the meeting. Well, I said it. I want to be at the meeting. Oh, Lord, now I want to be at the meeting. Well, now when all the saints get home. Well, 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 then after it's separated, Lord, from the right and the wrong, I said, I want to be at the meeting around the throne. Amen. 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 I'm going to sing one song that was a half and two halves. I'm going to sing one more song. Amen. And this is an old song, probably come out before I was born. And it's got to be old because I'm 82 years old. Amen. When that great crowd shall gather and you hear those church bells song just to hear that old greeting by your well and goodbye. You know my body, it will be there, but my soul, it will be gone. I'll be resting in my home beyond the sky, beyond the sky. When those church doors open wide and they roll me down the high, you know the preacher began to preach. And the choir began to sing. No, I won't be there. I won't be there. Oh, no, I won't be there. I'll be resting in my home beyond the sky, beyond the sky. When they lay me in my grave With my face up to watch the sun You know my work down here be done And my race, it will be run No, I won't be there I won't be there Oh, no I won't be there. I'll be resting in my home beyond the sky, beyond the sky. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. We give honor to our elders. Amen. He certainly did what was asked of him. Amen. Amen. Certainly we thank him to uh, readers of the passive scriptures and prayer. We certainly thank God. We'll come now to some reflections. Amen. As many can say so much and say a lot. 
uh, but we do not want you to come up and certainly weigh out uh, this family. Amen. What you can do is be respectful with your time. When you come up, they do not sit a time, but I'm going to ask you if you can try to keep it no more between two to three minutes. Uh, you're going to come up with reflections. Now, if I come up to the pulpit, that means you've certainly gone way over your three minutes. Amen. Amen. So uh, out of respect for the family, amen. So please, if you can, limit your time in your reflections. We have family members coming, and then we have some grandchildren will eventually be coming. But we certainly do want to recognize, amen, the class of 1967. Amen. Somebody said that's supposed to be the baddest class that came through. Amen. Albert always tell me that, but certainly we certainly do want to recognize his class. Amen. We thank God for them. At this time now, we're going to have, amen, some family members to come. The podium to my right, which is your left. Amen. You can come and speak into the mic. Amen. We have many who are watching us alive as well. At this time, we'll now have uh, Patsy Hardgrove and Barbara Gibbs will come and share. Following that, then we have some more family members coming. That is uh, Bush, Mr. Rogers, uh, Mr. Rogers, well, all three Rogers, <laughs> amen, will be coming following uh, Miss Gibbs, amen. Good afternoon. I was looking around for my brother, Jesse. He was supposed to come up here and stand with me. Okay, but God is good. I'll be all right. First, giving honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Reverend Dr. McCallum, uh, pulpit associates, the bereaved family, our family. I want to say thank you for allowing me to say a few words of reflection about our dearly beloved cousin, Tim. Amen. When we were growing up, all of my mother's siblings moved to Columbia, and we were the only ones left out in the country. In the country. That's what they called the country. Well, it wasn't a bad thing because we had the opportunity to experience both lives. Life in the city and life in the country. So during the summer months, we would spend, visit each other, and Tim was one that loved the country. And um, he, would, he would come more so than the, uh, more than the others would. So as uh, we got older, Tim um, told me that Jesse was his hero. And that's why I wanted Jesse to be up here, but I don't know what, his wife is sick, so something could have come up. And he said Jesse was his hero. Well, you know, we owned farm animals. We had chickens, hogs, cattle, and mules. Yeah, they were mules. Well, Jesse was the mule master. Jesse used to get on that mule, and he would do all kind of stunts. And that just mesmerized Tim. And he just loved to see Jesse act up on that mule. And uh, sometimes Jesse, he, he just had a love for animals. He thought he was a real buckaro. <laughs> and as the, uh, this minister here said today, I can allude to that. I, I cannot recall a time when I saw Tim angry, and that's the truth. That's the God heaven truth. He was always mild and soft spoken. Our families just loved each other, and as we got older, we would have family reunions, and what a time, what a time we would have. Now, we've just experienced an unexpected end. We didn't know. And I was speaking with Miss uh, Cousin Pat this week, and she was telling us that uh, Cousin Tim had been very, very sick, say about the last six weeks. And she would talk, have uh, conversations with God, and she asked God to 
please not let her husband suffer. And God granted her that wish, even though it was unexpected for us. Amen? But we know by and by that Tim is in a better place and that we're going to meet him on that other side. So Cousin Tim, sleep on and take your rest until we meet again. Your cousins from the country. Amen. <laughs> you are. You can. Good afternoon, everybody. First, give an honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who's the head of our lives. And protocol has already been established by my cousin, Patsy, so I won't repeat it again. But um, Warren, Harden, Tim, Rogers, my cousin, friend, and protector. Did you know I used to tease Tim about Warren Harden, the president. I told him he was going to be great one day, just like a president. <laughs> but Tim, as we so fondly call him, knew a lot of people in and around the Columbia area. And no matter where I was, I always ran into someone who said, do you know Tim? I said, yeah. I said, that's my cousin. I said, oh, okay. And I was proud to let everybody know that that was my cousin. But I remember on one special occasion, there was this young lady who came up to me, and she wanted to know and what, how was I with Tim? And I said, why? She said, because I just want to know. And I said, oh, okay. And I just kind of like played along and just let her you know, just sit there and think about stuff, you know, and then she said, are you related to Tim? I said, yes, that's my cousin. She said, oh, okay, and don't you know that he was married to that young lady for over 54 years? <laughs> now, Tim's mom, Danielle, and my mom were sisters, and his mom had all boys. And my mom had five girls. And um, we, we lived in Greenview. They lived on Gabriel Street, and we lived on Abraham Street. But um, I remember there were times when we would go to the store, and it was on the corner. Most of you today know it as the gas bar, but when we were young, it was Martin's Grocery Store. And um, Tim and his homies used to be up there on the corner all the time. So in order to get to the store, we had to walk past him and his homies. And don't you know, the first thing out of Tim's mouth was, go home. <laughs> and, you know, go home, he would tell us to go home all the time. But you know what we did? We just walked slowly so that everybody could see who we were. <laughs> and I don't think Tim ever apologized to us for embarrassing me and my friends and my sisters like that. But you know what? He always came by to check to make sure we made it home, okay? <laughs> and even when we went on to high school and I, Tim was a senior and I was a junior at C.A. Johnson, he was, every time he see me, he would always say, you all right? You all right? How y'all doing? Y'all doing okay? And he said, yeah, we doing fine. He always checked on us. And... Um, I could talk to him about anything at any time. But now, Tim, I get to tell you to go home. And you can continue to take your rest because God loves you best. You can sleep well knowing that God is looking down on us and making sure we get home today. Family, take comfort in knowing that Tim is in God's hands and he's resting peacefully and he's home. I love all of you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Rick, the oldest. 
When I took Tim to the doctor last Saturday, I didn't know that I would not, would not be coming back with him. He was, we talked, we joked, we even planned a cruise that we were going to take later this year. And uh, we went on one. It was the first time we ever went on one, so we decided we would go on another one. And it's really interesting. We need to be prepared for whatever. He was actually, when he passed, he was watching TV. So you don't know the time or place, so be you ready. One thing I liked about Tim, he was very resourceful. Whenever I needed anything, he would get with his buddies on Cody Street. If I needed a plumber, I would call Tim. Tim, I need a plumber. Will you get with his guys, the buddies, on Cody Street, and he'd get back with me. I needed, a mo I needed a electrician. That's how I met Cliff. He'd get with me. Anybody that I knew, Tim was it. The old saying goes, Ghostbusters? No, I would call Tim. <laughs> I would call Tim. And the other last thing was, I remember asking my mom, I said, Mom, how is it that Tim got to be a junior and not me? <laughs> I mean, I'm the oldest. How is it that, that he's Warren Harden Jr. and I'm Rick? She said, she, said, she, said, she said, well, it's like this. Your daddy was in the Westerns and you were Roy Rogers. <laughs> but some kind of way, I kind of liked the president, as Barbara had indicated, he was Warren Harden, and we thought perhaps maybe one day he might be a politician. Well, that never happened. Tim, I'm going to miss you. Sleep on, brother. I love you. I, I want to thank the church for allowing us, my family, to come in. It's just a wonderful thing. And I always want to thank the, the two churches that always be with, with our family. That's the Greensby Baptist Church and Green Hill Baptist Church. Those, those are our churches. And, but as they were saying, growing up in the 50s and 60s, there was a, a lot of things going on. And we had a lot of family around us, and that's what we did. We played with each other. In fact, still friends with the people that we grew up with. This week I've been seeing a lot of them and that's over 70 years ago that all of us grew up together. I see them here today and I really appreciate what they've done for us and what anything we try to ask, anything we asked for, they did it. And, and Tim, Tim loved his family and his friends but uh, especially his grandkids. He really loved them, and he loved my grandkids, too. <laughs> so he loved, when I'm always, like I say, getting it, he always tried to give them good advice, and uh, that was his goal. And he, sometimes he gave me good advice, too, but I didn't listen sometimes. That's when I got in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, but when Tim came back from service, he, uh, my stepdad had a, a little baseball team, <laughs> and, Tim, and Tim took it over as manager. Him and Tim was managing that baseball team, and they, they, that's every week they would have something going on. But it helped, not only helped him, it helped our community because it was like fun times for our community with that baseball team. And it kept us, kept us a lot, out of a lot of trouble because we could have gotten in a lot of trouble back then. But that and having something to do made a lot of difference in our lives. And, uh, and t Tim also uh, loved, the, uh, loved the Lord and he loved his brother because he was always on me about something. <laughs> but I, then in closing, I just want to say a, a, a couple of things that, uh, that we as a family, we're going to always trust in the Lord and let him lead us and guide us to where we need to be because without him, we, we won't make it. And, and then it's in a little closing line. It's uh, Matthew 11, 28. It says, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will you rest. I will give you rest, so that's Tim, rest on, and I'm going to miss you dearly.
Hello, church. I'm going to miss my big brother. Because he always, if he wanted something, he'll call me. And I've always been there for him. And Rodney and Tanya, um, y'all take care of your mama and Pat. If y'all need something, just pick up the phone and call. Kim Westbrook, I got you. Hello to everybody. Um, to the men of God. Um, they said mostly everything, but I, I really had a, me and Kim happened to be born on the same day. And we had a little special bond that day, and um, nobody could come between that day. It was just me and his. And, um, Tim was a man among men. He hung with men, and he had respect for men. Some of his friends, way back, you know, I used to walk by, and they would say, that's Tim Westbrook, young brother. Oh, God, I stick up my chest. I'm Tim, brother. I can go on Harlem hiking everywhere. You know, but... um. He had friends like Jesse Stearns and uh, Cliff and, and, and uh, Leon, Leon, whatever, and, uh, and Payne and Colleen. If he called you his friend, he meant a friend for life. And he loved them, and they loved him, and they loved the first ladies of their family. And uh, I just don't know. God is good. And uh, the Roger family have been through some trying times in the last two or three years. But God has kept us together. And we're going to move on as a family. And God bless y'all. Thank you. Praise God. Let's give God a round of applause. Huh? Uh, I'm Tim's oldest uncle. I think I'm his oldest uncle on both sides of the family and probably his last living uncle on both sides of the family. Mr. Gibbs, I think, think he's old, but he's a young man. I'm 87. He's 82, okay? But... A lot's been said, but I'm going to say this. I know this is a time to be pessimistic, but I'm going to ask the family, friends, to be optimistic and give God praise that God allowed us to spend 75 years with him. So let's just praise God. Thank you. certainly thank uncle for clearing it all up. Amen. Amen. God bless him and the brothers. Amen. Certainly to uh, all who have shared of his family. We do have, I think his grandchildren would like to come. Someone from the grandchildren would like to come and share. And following the remarks from the grandchildren, then we'll be prepared to hear from Sister Taylor again. Amen. With a song that will prepare, prepare the preacher to stand and share on behalf of his family as well. Hello. I'm Chayla. These are my cousins. And that's my son. And we are Pat and Tim's grandchildren. Looking around today, I can feel the love in this room for our papa. Tim loved his wife, Patricia, so much. One month shy, 55 years married. They created such a beautiful life together. Our papa was very family oriented. He loved his family and his friends and would do anything for anyone, just like his mother. Tim was always okay, no matter what. He never wanted you to worry about him. 
We were brought here by sadness of a loss, but let us not forget what we have gained. We gain memories, and Papa gains his spot in heaven, and he is waiting to be reunited with all of us. Live life to the fullest. Live it with purpose. Live it with love in your heart and God as the center of your life. Let this not be goodbye, just simply until we meet again. I've had my grandpa in my life my whole life. <laughs> and one of the hardest things about this life is because then coming to terms with the fact that he's not here anymore. Um, he, he used to pick all of us up from school, take us to get um, lunch on Fridays. Um, uh, uh, he won't be here anymore to try and offer me gas money. <laughs> <laughs> And he won't be here anymore to watch the Cowboys games or uh, <laughs> or uh, listen to me tell him that all the Westerns he watches were racist. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking through all the uh, pictures of Papa, um, I, I realized that even though he was in my life my whole life, I only knew him for about a third of his. Um, I, I don't know what kind of kid he was. I don't know who he was in high school. I don't know what happened to him in Vietnam, and I don't know why he never once answered, I'm not okay, even when he was in so much pain. What I do know is that he loved me. I know he loved my siblings, my cousin, all of his, all of his, all of his grandkids. Um, he loved his brothers, his nieces, his nephews. He loved my dad and my uncle. Um, and he was in love with my grandpa. And I, I know that my papa um, um, loved everyone here. And um, knowing that you guys all loved him makes the day a lot easier, so thank you. Um, bye, papa, I'm going to miss you. I love you. Um, it's called God's Garden. God looked around his garden and found an empty place. He then looked down upon the earth and saw your tired face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful. He always takes the best. He saw the road was getting rough and the hills were hard to climb. So he closed your weary eyelids and whispered, peace be thine. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone. So part of us went with you the day called you, the day God called you home. Thank you. Um, I remember um, when I first met Papa. Um, Many of you might not know I was adopted into the family and dad took me there and he was like, this your grandbaby. And Papa was like, who grandbaby? <laughs> and he was like, well, welcome to the family. And I'm just so grateful to call him my Papa, even though he might not be blood. He loved me like I was his blood. And I'm grateful for that. And I love him. This song says, um, talks about the goodness of God and his faithfulness. And I'm pretty sure it's familiar to you, so. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. 
I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life, all my life you have been faithful. Oh yes you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest times. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. Come on, in all my life, all my life you have been faithful, oh yes you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running out. My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Yeah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I'll give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me It's all my life you have been faithful All my life, God has been so, so good. With every breath that we are able, we should see of the goodness of God. No matter what comes, continue to see. At the church, say amen. Come on and say it like you mean it. We give honor to the spirit of Christ Jesus, chief shepherd of the church, 
and to this pastor. to this fine college of ministers and clergy persons in the pulpit and those who are on the floor to the offices of this church and its members to this bereaved family, this wife, and these children and grandchildren, these siblings, and all who have come today to worship the Lord and celebrate the life and the legacy of Tim Rogers. Grace and peace be unto you from God the Father and from Jesus who is the Christ of God. Some people would uh, have difficulty believing it, but this too is a day that the Lord has made. And those of us who know him and have hope in him, we should be extraordinarily careful how we handle today. We should rejoice and be glad in it. Now, um, I want to offer my condolences to this wife of 50 pli 55 years or thereabout. Girl, you something else. <laughs> you have always been, and you know that he loved and cherished you. You were, you were special. And he wasn't ashamed to make that known. And um, I uh, haven't had a chance to talk with you. I was at your house yesterday, but I had a little emergency, and I had to rush away before I came in. But we'll get a chance to chat. Just know that you are much loved, and I know you feel that way. And to these sons, boys, you all have something to be proud of. You had a daddy that was strong, and he was present, and he was there for you, and there with you. And hopefully, you've learned something from this man among men in our family circle. Surely you have learned what it is to be a loving and a caring father and a faithful and dutiful husband. And if you've learned nothing else, you should have learned this. And you should have learned love for family. Tim loved his family. He loved his mother. And uh, he loved his siblings. And he didn't mind showing that. And the extended family, we all knew what it was to feel loved, valued, and appreciated because Tim just had that unique thing about him. To these grandchildren, I say the same to you. God gave you a unique, a special, loving and caring grandfather. And these brothers, I mean, you all were, <laughs> that house over there on Gable Street was one of a kind. <laughs> yeah, Bobby mentioned it, the baseball team and the barbecue and in the backyard, you know, those days, I remember those days as vividly as they were yesterday. As yesterday. Uncle Willie would throw up the grill in the backyard and he'd go to cooking and the boys would be all around from the field, boys in the neighborhood young people from the neighborhood. He had, uh, Uncle Willie had a special thing with young, young people, especially young men. And um, the thing I remembered about that experience was Uncle, Uncle Willie would cook on the grill, but by the time he finished cooking, he will have eaten two chickens. 
I remember those days. Now the Lord has spoken. Patricia, the Lord has spoken. And these sons, the Lord has spoken. You grandchildren, the Lord has spoken. You brothers, the Lord has spoken. He has been doing it ever since the morning of creation. Speaking. And when he speaks, his will is made known. This is the God who gave you uh, Tim as a husband, as a father, a grandfather as a sibling, and what he's done now is the same thing he did in the first place. As calmly and quietly as he gave you Tim, without a fuss, without an argument, he has now asked you, can I have what I gave you? And if I gave him to you that long and trusted him in your tender, solicitous care, can I have what first belonged to me? And you know, one of the things I learned about God in my journey with him is never, ever, under any circumstances, does God ask us for anything that he did not first give us. The question is always, can I have it back? And can I have it back without a fuss, without a fight? And that's what we've come to do today. We've come to say, yes, Lord. Tim was yours before he was ours. You can have him back. And I know that he come from you, and that which comes from God always goes back to God. That's the best way to handle days like today. Now, my, uh, uh, the patriarch and the matriarch of our family is here also. My daddy's youngest brother is here, and the only one left is here to support us. And the youngest sister is here. The only one left is here with us. And that's a blessing, isn't it? That's a blessing. And uh, they are surrounded by us, their nieces and nephews, and they've come to be with us. They've been doing this kind of thing a long time. And uh, we're, we're happy to have them here with us to support us. I want to say thank you to this preacher, pastor, for sharing this preaching spot with me. I do appreciate it. Um, I called him yesterday just to let him know it was all right if I come by. I know he is the chief rabbi in this region, and I wanted to get his approval to come this way, and he gladly consented to do so, and I thank him uh, for that. And I, I'm like uh, Reverend Johnny Gibbs, first cousin, we are too. He sang what he called two half a songs <laughs> and one whole song. That's the first time I ever heard of anything like that. <laughs> that just goes to tell you that not only is he older than I am, but he knows some things that I, I don't know. I didn't know there was a half a song and a whole song. I learned something today. That's just not because he's older, but that's because he's antique. <laughs> and when you antique, you just know things that others don't know. But I like him up here to, uh, to, uh, to keep uh, or to do something that I was asked to do. I did not know this because um, Bobby didn't share this with me. Uh, until the other night. Tim never shared it with me. Pat never shared it with me. But when I took the call the other night that he had passed, 
and that he had slipped away from us. I was grieved. I was just coming in from South Africa where I had uh, been to eulogize a dear friend and a fellow missionary, a missionary, one of the, the key men on the ground in South Africa who works for me there. And my heart was grieved because the last time I saw Tim, he looked well, he sounded well. And to get the report that he had slipped away so suddenly, as um, Pat said, Pastor said, it just, it troubled me in spirit for a moment there. But then, Bobby called a day or two later to say, the funeral is going to be Saturday, and they want you to do the eulogy. My brother said that he wanted you to do the eulogy. And Johnny kept his end of the bargain by delivering the two half a songs in one way. Now, I'm not going to try to do two half a sermons in one whole. That ain't going to work. But I do want to call your prayerful attention, if you will. I, I, I thought about this this morning. I went by the coffee shop and got me a cup of coffee, and I thought about what I would want to say here today. And what I want to say is tucked away. Actually, it's, <laughs> I said it, and I meant what I said. Um, it won't be two half sermons in one whole week. But what I want to say is tucked away, the thoughts are tucked away in three passages of Scripture. One verse, each one of them, two of them with one verse, and one of them with the latter part of one verse, all of which we are familiar with. The first one is found in the Old Testament book of Job in the form of a question. If a man dies, shall he live again? The second one is found in the Gospel of St. John, chapter number 10, and verse number 10. And they come from the lips of Jesus Christ, who says there, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. And the third is taken also from the Gospel of St. John, chapter number 14, and 19b, chapter 14, verse 19b, the latter part of 19. Again, from the lips of Jesus comes the words, because I live, you shall live also. And I want to take a few minutes to say something about an Old Testament problem and a New Testament solution. An Old Testament problem and a New Testament solution. Pray with me for one moment. Now, God, these are your people, and I am your servant. Our hearts have been made heavy because death has invaded our ranks yet again and taken one whom we love and we are forced by your providence to bow before you in submission to your will. We look inside your word today to see if there is something there that will enable us to stand on the lips of the grave once again and give back to Mother Earth that which came out of it. Our brother, a father, uh, and a grandfather, a sibling. Now give us what we need 
that our ears will be opened and our hearts will be opened to hear and receive the word of hope which you are ready to give in Jesus' name. Amen. I call this little meditation an Old Testament problem or an Old Testament dilemma and the New Testament solution. I think you'll agree with me that the question of the ages has always been, if a human being dies, is it possible that they can live again? In all of human history, no man has ever asked a more important question, a more uh, how shall I put it, penetrating question than the question posed in Job chapter 14 and verse 14. And I remind you that the man who raised this age-old question is not just any old man. Job was a man of deep and abiding faith. Faith in the reality of God. Faith in the power of God, faith in the will of God, faith in the purpose of God, in the plan of God, and in the providence of God. Job, you see, was a man like Tim, a man of um, some faith as is evidenced in the obituary that you read here today, taking the rite of baptism at an early age and growing up uh, to love God and to honor God. That's one thing you can say about our family is we do believe in God. And uh, many of us try our level best to know him, to love him, to serve him, and, um, and that kind of thing. That's the kind of man Job was, and that's the kind of man who raised the question here. Job was not any old man raising a question. The Bible tells us that Job was an upstanding man in the community. You read it for yourself when you get home. A man of means, if you will, with plenty of property and plenty of family. He was a family man like Tim, was a loving wife and ten children, seven sons and three daughters. He was deeply religious. His faith was not a raggedy man's faith. And by that I mean the dope Job didn't just talk to talk. Job walked to walk. Job was a man of unusual faith. The Bible says that Job's faith was so deep and he took it so seriously that he prayed every day, not only for himself, but even for his children, just in case his children forgot to pray. Now, beloved, that's faith. When you got enough faith for yourself and a little bit for somebody else also. Job's faith was deep. He walked to walk as well as talked to talk. And the Bible says that Job was, uh, 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 in fact, it says that there was nobody in town like Job. Nobody in Job's community like Job. Job was said to be a perfect man. That didn't mean he did not make mistakes. Now, that's not what it meant there. But it meant that Job was a man who took seriously his walk with God. Amen. It, it, it means that Job, in fact, it goes on to say that there wasn't nobody in the village, nobody in town quite like Job. He was upright. He was just in his dealings. Fair in the way he handled his, his business in the community. God looked at Job and says, Job uh, was a good man. And not only did God say it, even Satan agreed with God. Because one day, you do know Satan watches your religion, don't you? 
Satan pays attention to your devotion to God, to your commitment to God. Satan pays attention to whether or not you are living what you say you are. Satan pays close attention to your walk with God. Never underestimate the devil. He's got his eyes on you. One day when the sons of God came together, the book says when they came together and the Lord asked the devil, where have you been? Satan says, I've been going to and fro in the land, seeking whom I may devour or whom I may chew up and spit out. And the Lord looked at him and said, well, now, have you considered my servant Job? Satan said, yes, I have. But you, you've got a fence around Job. You, you got a hedge around Job. If you don't remember anything else that I have said or will say, you remember Satan is carefully watching you and your relationship with your God. I wonder, can I get a witness? I know it's not revival, but every now and then I feel good when I'm telling this little story. Yeah, so Satan, the Bible says that Job was a perfect man who stayed away from evil. He, he stayed away from evil. And uh, of course, um, uh, then one awful day, one awful day when Satan had been in the presence of the Lord and told the Lord, I done tried to trip everybody else up I can find. And I can't find nobody else lately to trip up. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? And then the Lord said to say that I'll tell you what go ahead then I'll tell you what you go ahead and touch him now uh, but don't you touch his soul this is good religion I'm talking about you know the devil can't bother you unless God gives him permission he can't mess with you unless God gives him the okay to do so that's because we are protected if he says that uh, the Lord told him, go ahead, but don't you, don't, don't you touch his soul. So there goes Job, poor fella. And there he was um, going about his business. And he found himself in great tribulation. One after the other, Job seemed to have lost everything. Everything was dying. All his cattle dying. All his sheep dying. I wonder, can I get a witness? His herd and his flocks all dying. His finance dying. And if that was not enough, he faced the death of all ten of his children. Seven sons and three daughters. All on the same day. In the same house. From the same problem. Those children that he prayed for was having a party like us bushes tend to do every now and then. And a storm came out of nowhere and took all Job's children at one time, y'all. You know it's one thing when you lose one. But have you ever lost two at one time or three at one time? Now, can you imagine Job has got to go to the funeral home and make arrangements for ten funerals all at one time? He faced death square in the face. Ten caskets, ten graves, ten eulogies. That's too much for one man to bear. So, now, if that wasn't bad enough, the text says, if you read it, that it went on and Job got sick when Satan came back and God says, I said to God, I took everything he had. I done took all his stocks and his bonds, his property. I've taken his sheep. I've taken his cattle. I've taken the children. And I can't get this man to budge. He still loves you. He still worships you. He still adores you. He still trusts you. Yeah. The Lord said, now you go ahead then, Satan. I tell you what, if you think you can bend him, make him bend. Go ahead and touch his body, but leave that soul. That's mine. The soul is precious cargo, don't you? You touch it. You can have that flesh, but that soul is mine. I redeem that. That soul. 
belongs to me. Well, Job got sick, and the Bible says that he was broke out in souls from his head to his toe. And here come them neighbors of his, those buddies of his, three friends of his. And they come to look at Job suffering in pain and in agony. Job is in sorrow, lost everything he has, a poor man now with no stock, no bonds, no money, no children. All the family gone except one, and that's his wife. And she's not behaving like she's got any sense at all. All Job has is his faith and his confidence in God. And he gets sick, and here come his friends looking at him, bounding up his wounds in the ashes. And they go to theologizing about why Job has had so much uh, bad luck. They go to talking about, well, he was religious, but he must not have been that religious. He was righteous, but he wasn't that right. I thought he had so much religion. What happened now? He must not have been that. Ain't nothing in more sickening in the world than barbershop theologians. They came to Job, and then his wife said to him, this is ridiculous. Why don't you just get it over with? Why don't you curse God and die? And Job raised the question of the 14th chapter. And when he asked that question, he wasn't just asking it for Job. He was asking it for me. He was asking it for you. And the question is, if a man dies, shall he live again? That question has haunted generations. Upon every generation has to deal with it. And all of the prophets, the major and minor prophets, have all dealt with it in some way, some form. If a man dies, shall he live again now now so that raises the question let me put it to you in a paraphrase i'm almost finished i'll be out of here in just a minute is death the final end of the person is this all shall we love like pat has loved for 55 years and have it end in the cemetery is this all? Shall you lose the father that you so loved and adored never to see him again? The brother who walked so closely with you, with whom you laughed and played and enjoyed so much of life, and with whom you wept in moments like this. Is this all? Does our hope end at the trade of the embalmer's hand? Is the grave our final lot? Now, if it is, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry. That's all. But thank God for Jesus. Somebody shout, thank God for Jesus. All over this globe and all over the world, there are people who are raising Job's question. Keep on asking the question over the ages. If a man dies, shall he live again? Job spoke for us all. But thank God there is an answer to the Old Testament problem. And it's in the New Testament. Along comes Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And he addressed this problem better than any of the prophets could ever address this problem. Listen to Jesus, the New Testament answer. He says, first and foremost, I know what you are looking for. You're looking for life. I know what you are trying to cling to. You're trying to cling for life. I know what your deepest longing is. You long for life that does not end in the cemetery. I know what you're looking for. 
So he says, I come that you might have life and not just any life, but abundant life. Let me tell you before I take my seat. Now, you may be living, but if you're not anchored in Christ, you don't have abundant life. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how fine a home you live in. I don't care what you have. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't have abundant life. Now, you may have life. But it's not abundant life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jesus said, I, I, I came that you may have life. And I just don't want you to have any kind of life. I want you to have more. Yeah. Somebody shout more. Yeah. More joy. Yeah. More. More peace. More. More hope. Yeah. More. More tranquility. I want you to have it, and I want you to have it abundantly, he says. I feel sorry for people who are trying to figure life out and got to cheat their way to good living, got to steal everything, take from somebody else. I feel sorry for people who have to have a pill to get up in the morning and a pill to lay down at night. I feel sorry for people who have to get a high off of this and a high off of that. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. So he says, I come that you might have life and you may have it more abundantly. I've come to remind you, faithful wife, loving sons, and grandchildren, siblings, all of us who mourn, I've come to remind you today, and I've come to challenge you to think about life and think about death. Yeah. And the question Job raises is about death. If a man dies, shall he live again? The two are inextricably bound together. You can't have one without the other. If you get life, you're going to get death. I know that's right. You might as well admit it. And you know what? All of us are already dying. The youngest one of us in this room are in the process of dying right where you sit. Now, it will take some of us longer to finish dying than it will others, but we will all die. But we will not all live again. That's a problem. That's a problem. And that's why Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Well, Jesus, it don't look that way. And that's my third scripture I read. How do I know I'm going to have it? I haven't always been right. I made some bad decisions in my life. I haven't always stood as tall as I now stand. I've said things I had no business saying. I've done things I had no business doing. I've been places I had no... Come on, y'all talk back to me now. No need of us acting like we are some kind of sanctified peacocks up in here. My Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only definition for all I know is all. That includes you. Yes, sir. I, I thank God for this passage. It gives me hope. Because I, I'm going to be stretched out somewhere like Tim is today. And, and, and I don't have any other hope than Jesus Christ. And he speaks all the corridors of time. And I hear him saying today as I go to my seat, because I live. Help me, Holy Ghost. Not because you joined the church, but because I live. Not because you've been baptized, but because I live. Not because you've been licensed and ordained, but because I live. You shall live also. And that's enough for me. 
The good news of the gospel is Christ lives. Have I got a witness? We just coming out of the Easter season and the news of the gospel is that Christ lives. And the whole church ought to shout hallelujah. Christ lives. Certainly, what a challenging and refreshing message. And when you know Christ, the day may look like a sad, a gloomy day, but actually it isn't. When one lives and dies knowing Christ, the church can celebrate. For those who die who do not know Christ have no hope. But to those of us who live and die in Christ, we have a resurrecting hope. And that's good news. I say that's good news. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Bush, for reminding us. Amen. That age-old question, that theological question that every one of us every now and then will lay down and need to ask ourselves, if I die, can I live again? He gave us the answer. Through Christ Jesus, you and I can live again. Now, I don't, we don't normally do this in funerals, but I, I dare not to miss this opportunity. I don't know there may be someone sitting among us who at the threshold needing to make a decision. And I want you to know Christ shows up in any endeavor when he's been invited. And I don't know about you, but I know he's here and I feel it. There might be someone here today, and I want you to look around, this is personal. Doesn't matter how young you are, does not matter how old you are. The preacher reminded us there's one thing going to work against all of us, it's called time. Time. God give every one of us the same amount of time every day. You and I got up today, but there's not a one promise that you will get back to your house late on today. I must ask the question, if by chance you don't make it back in home, can you say all is well? Because if it's not well, only you and God knows that answer. I will be afraid to leave here and miss this opportunity to know Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you feel something moving on, on the little inside of you, God saying, that's me trying to reach you, saying, I need you to come now. Come while you're able to walk. Don't wait till they roll you to the church. Because if they roll you in, you don't have another chance. You come now. If, if you're here today and you hear the voice of God tugging you, I want you to rise to your feet and walk down to the front. You come and don't wait another minute. When Pastor Bush stand before God, he will not be found guilty for not telling you the truth about the ways of God to man. If you're here today and you hear the voice of God, I want you to come. If you backslid and you made some mistakes and errors and you need to come to be restored and repent, you ought to come. I believe Miss Patricia would not want it no other way to extend that someone. If you are here, will you come? All right, nobody's coming. That means everybody have their house totally in order. Whatever happens, you say, I know it's well with me. I'm heaven bound. Thank you, Dr. Bush, for reminding us and certainly informing us. Yes, man can live again. As our funeral directors will come, amen, the final internment will take place, amen, at Fort Jackson, the National Cemetery for Mr. Rogers. But we do say to the family, of the Rogers family that we do have a repast prepared for you over at our center across the street, amen. And we want, um, certainly Miss Rogers and her sons will want you to know you're more than welcome uh, to certainly join them there, amen. If we'll, we would at least do the committal here as well, because there may be some perhaps may not be able to
go to the National Cemetery for the final internment. Amen. And as we prepare ourselves for that final internment, we are reminded that man that is born of a woman has but a short time to live, and it is with misery that he lives, that he may continue, that he may seek for succor, but thee, O Lord, most holy, most merciful, most all-wise, most everlasting Father. And as much as you are pleased that you have taken out of this world the soul, deceased soul of our beloved brother, Mr. Warren Harden Rogers, Jr., we therefore now commit his body back to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. Looking for the re re resurrection, the general resurrection of our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus the Christ, who shall appear in the second coming, that he shall call and all see the earth, all shall yield and give up their dead. And there we all shall be caught up in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And there we shall behold and see him for ourselves and not another. John goes and writes in the last book of the Bible called the book of Revelations. John says something unique. And he said, those who have lived and died in the Lord, they will rest from their labors. But I like what John goes on and say even more in that book. He said, the day will come when the bridegroom shall come. And there the new Jerusalem will be lit. John said, and that great city, there are 12 gates there. Three gates in the east, three gates in the west, three in the south and the north. And there shall be every kind, every creed, every race, every color shall make their way to that great city called the New Jerusalem. And the city will be lit not from the S-U-N, but it will be lit from the S-O-N, son that he preached about of God. And oh, when we shall go to that great city lit, every race, creed, and color will go in one of those gates. I don't know about you, but I just want to make sure that you and I will get to one of those gates and walk in, and we shall see him for ourselves and not behold another. I say this to you, but they can't crown him king of kings, and they cannot crown him lord and lords until we get there too. Until we get there, we shall see him for ourselves. We say to our beloved friend and brother, a good soldier, father, husband, friend, grandfather, but more importantly, a child of God. Well done, Christ will only can say to him, well done. You have, now can rest from your labors. Thank you, Dr. Bush, for that message. That was a timely message and a befitting message for all of us and for the Rogers and Bush family. Certainly we thank you on behalf, certainly, of this wonderful services by the Bostick and Tompkins. We certainly thank them. They will come now and make some observations and follow their presentations. We shall return with the benediction or blessings and that you shall join us over at the Wiley Kennedy Family Life Center for fellowshipping together. On behalf of the Bostick Tompkins Funeral Home, whereas David E. Tompkins Sr. is our owner, and Nick Shell, our manager and director, I would like to present this plaque, and it reads as follows. As we mourn our dearly departed with mixed emotions and broken hearted, we are never prepared to say goodbye, and the ultimate question is always why. We'll question the wisdom of his ways and thirst for answers in the coming days. Somehow, we'll seek to understand why life is forfeited upon demand. An eternal flame will light the way as we embrace Tim's memory each and every day. Ye servants who have passed your earthly test, 
God grant unto them eternal rest. Rest in peace is the fervent vow of this earth he leads men. Hear our prayers, O Lord above, in loving memory of William Harden Rogers, Jr., affectionately known as Pooh, whom we all Give God a hand clap of praise for the life of Tim. Now that's all right, but a church full of people, we can give God a little better praise than that. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for his life and legacy. A great man of God now lay idle. Nurturing hands are now at risk. Because he answered the call of his master when heaven required the very best. Your family circle is now broken. Hurt, pain, and sorrow is some of what you feel. Over glory to a true and living God. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. So family, remember, God love you. He love you and he care. And he'll never put more on you than he's equipped to bear. While I stand, I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of this family to say thank you to each and every one of you who cared enough to come the last mile of the way. We thank you for your floral arrangements. We thank you for your phone calls. But most of all, we thank you for your prayers. We come understanding that prayer changes things. So we come to give God, even in times like these, all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. And as I stand, I'd like to thank our pastor, Reverend McCallum, as well as Reverend Bush for the words of comfort he shared with us. And to you, Pastor Gills, we thank you for those two half of the songs you gave us. But nevertheless, we thank God for Tim. I grew up with Tim. He's always been an inspiration. And as I said earlier, some of us was mean and ungodly. He was always meek, humble, and mild. <laughs> That's enough to give God a hand clap of praise right there. <laughs> and finally, on behalf of our director and manager, Nick Shell, and the entire staff at the Boston Thomas Institute, we thank you for entrusting your loved one into our care. We hope that you found our services to be satisfactory. If so, then we reached another milestone. And as we leave here, I remind you that even in times like these, we serve a God that he can give all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Amen. Amen. Again, we certainly thank uh, this family uh, for uh, allowing us to be a place that you can say your final goodbye. Uh, amen to your loved one. On behalf of Chairman Michael Glover and, and Deacon Edmund, Vice Edmund, and to the church family of Bethlehem, amen, Sister Rogers' family, to the sound and tech video and a musician, we certainly thank, and our ushers, we thank you as we have come to serve you on this time. If there's anything that Bethlehem can still do in the very near future, please do not hesitate to let us know we're here to serve you. If not, a place to worship, join us tomorrow at the 10 a.m. hour. We're going to talk about taking a trip, a tour to heaven and hell. You don't want to miss this one. We look forward to you certainly uh, being blessed by God. Again, repast has been prepared across the street over at the Wiley Kennedy Center. You can join us, amen, as you share moments of reflections on behalf of the Roger and Bush family. We thank you so very much. Amen. As we get ready to depart this place with never God's presence, again, the final internment will be this coming Wednesday at the 1 p.m. hour at the National Cemetery there on Fort Jackson. If you're going to join the family, please be there on time. Amen. At this time, we're going to let, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Bush, my senior, come, his family. He will close us out as he would like, Dr. Bush.
let us know that this family will remain in our prayers. We pray your strength in the Lord and that you will be given all that you need to get through the next few weeks and months as you try to adjust to this new reality that has come to us. Let us stand now and remain standing until the family has recessed from the sanctuary.